was better in New Jersey, right? I believe I believe the fan base was better in you're New Jersey. You're crazy. You're fucking crazy. Hell yeah. Gets it off in time. And he's going, baby. Big time. Nets win. The only what? The only Nets fans you know. Man. I mean, come on, man. man. Or are these guys? Welcome back to the Only Net Fans You Know podcast. I'm Peter. Welcome to episode number 71, False Hope. But first, I got to get into our guest today. A returning guest, big on IG, big on Instagram. I wonder being, I think, on one of his first podcast episodes. All of a sudden, he I, I noticed he's become the villain of Nets Twitter. Everybody hates him. People that I like, people that I fuck with are now cursing him out, getting into fights with him. I have no idea what's going on. Welcome to the show, Dylan from Nets Press IG. You can go Nets Press, Dylan, uh, douchebag of Twitter, I don't know, whatever you want. <laughs> Is there anything to fix this team? It's it's just, this team looks like it's given up. Like, you know, Macau said during the two Hawks game, it felt like a playoff environment. Where did that go? Every game should be your playoff environment now. You are 13 games below 500. There's no excuses anymore. You there's just, There's not a single thing. You can't blame Ben. You can't blame Cam Thomas. You can't blame you know, a certain player for not being there. You can't blame a certain player on the floor for not providing. These guys are just not a playoff team. They're not even a play-in team. It's the sad reality, but I've been saying this for a year now. I told you guys earlier when, you know, we didn't trade McCall uh, in the offseason. I said, does he have star potential? Yes. Is it going to be a first or second option? No. He's a third option at best, and that's how it's going to be. Realistically, though, with the way the team's going, this narrative, like you said, the episode's called False Hope. They're trying to feed us false hope into believing that we can get a, a superstar, another star, and, and be a contender. The, the bottom line is you're not competing with Boston if they keep that core together. You're not competing with Philly if they stay healthy and add another star. You're not competing with Indiana, who potentially may be getting Paul George in the offseason. You're not competing with the Knicks if they stay healthy. You're not competing with the Cavs if they stay with Donovan Mitchell. What's the point of going for a contender when you have no picks, when you have to get rid of the remaining picks that you have and give us as fans this false hope that we can actually win something when in reality, if Kyrie, Katie, and Harden couldn't do it, I don't see something happening here within the next three years where they can try and rush the process into building a contender. Don't you think this would have been the year the Nets could kind of could have taken the East on? I feel like finally the East is kind of weakened. I mean, really, I wouldn't even have... say it's weakened yet. Right? I, I wouldn't even say it's weakened, honestly. I mean, let's be real. Embiid's hurt. He, we hate him. He's a free throw merchant and we know it, but he will dominate us every time in the playoffs, whether it's, you know, us having to triple team him and, and force other people to score, which they did last year. Uh, whether it's Damon Milwaukee finally getting it together, which they are. And Boston. I mean, Boston's the best team in basketball right now. I am I am a Boston as an entire city hater. Everybody knows this. Uh, they have ruined my franchises in every sport over the past 15 to 20 years. So realistically do i th i personally think last year would have been our year even if we kept K uh katie and Kyrie. i mean if you look at the east uh milwaukee broke down uh boston broke down to to miami we we probably if we made the right deadline moves and kept Kyrie and katie i could have seen us in the finals last year definitely so i think 2021 without injuries and 2023 could have been our championship window depending on what moves we make in 2024. I mean, I know that we had offers on the table for Rigo Bear, for Ben Simmons, Donovan Mitchell, for Ben Simmons. There was options that we had where we could have uh, moved on from Ben Simmons early on to gain that true uh, third star and really solidify this team for, you know, an extra two to four years uh, expanding the window. But ultimately, you know, they pulled the trigger. Uh, props to, I'm, I'm going to give a shout out to the Los Angeles Clippers. They sh did what we should have done, which is re-signing Kawhi, re-signing Harden, bringing in other big names, adding depth. They did everything right. You don't give up on an experiment after three years, uh, and you sure as hell don't let three top 15 players at the time walk for the team that we have now. So it's definitely three disappointing. Same players. Yeah. Yep. Three I mean, you traded MVP players. Hart. And the funny part is, is and not even to get off topic, but I'll, I'll make this quick. People love to shit on Harden for what he did in Brooklyn. You remember he was top five in MB, uh, MVP candidacy. He was averaging 28 and 12. Um, you know, there was a month where he was averaging, I believe, 30 and 13. So it's not like he didn't do anything here. Uh, personally, if I was the Nets back then, I would have traded Kyrie uh, during the COVID year to keep Harden happy and to to keep KD, you know, give him an, an extra piece. 
more depth because that, that's what we needed at the time was depth. So I think Katie and Harden could have at least uh, made a push in the East last year as well. So, but things happen. Uh, we're, we're past it. So, but yeah, that, that's my whole thought process on the East right now. I mean, it, it's, it's not wide open, but it's definitely minimal at the moment. But even at the minimal, you could add two stars to this team next year and it's not going to compete. It's not going to. You have to figure out the coaching. You have to figure out the the front office. It truly does look like players are wanting to leave that are on the court right now. I mean, Mikel talked about body language. It's not getting better. You know, don't no, nobody's giving fist bumps to Kevin Ali, who, you know, supposedly they want to jock Vaughn out. Now they got their new coach and they can't they don't even respect him. And this is a well-respected coach, you know, within the college level. Wait, wait, how uh, come they don't respect him? How do you know that? Dennis Smith Jr., after the game, he wasn't, uh, you know, speaking to him or looking at him. Actually, Ali had to pull him aside a little bit and talk to him. Uh, Macal Bridges, there was a video last night that you I saw. You think that was a going. minutes thing? How do you know? You don't know. I mean, even if, it's, even if it's a minutes thing, if you don't deserve the minutes, you shouldn't be complaining. So That happens th- all the time in the NBA. This is a job. There's, there's a respect level, though, for coaches, especially – those types of things can happen for teams that are winning when you're losing and you aren't providing, there's no reason you should be upset other than with yourself. Can't be, that can't be upset with coaches and minutes. The, every, especially it's, losing it's, teams, you feel like that you should be playing. It still doesn't look right, dude. It does. Oh, of course there, it doesn't look some, right. But that's, there's that, that's something not going real. on. You're not being realistic. There's something going on in that locker room. I think it's because of the fact that we don't have a true leader and the coaching staff isn't just taking that next step into trying to get these guys together. Like I said, you can blame every single person in this organization. There's no one person that you can blame, but it definitely seems off that players aren't really uh, showing the appreciation to Ali after wanting, you know, Vaughn Gunn. And it, it's it's a little weird to me. But, I mean, realistically, an outside hire is what I want. I'm hoping we don't re-sign Ali, even though I do think he will be a good coach at some point in time, especially for a different team, because we all know that our assistants go on to be pretty good coaches elsewhere. Uh, um, so, I, you know. We'll, we'll see what happens, but there's just little tiny things that I'm starting to notice within this team that are definitely concerning and showing every sign that we should blow it up and rebuild. Well, I can tell you what's going on with the with the Kevin Ollie in the locker room. This was the issue with Jock Vaughn, right? He came in last year after Nash was fired, and the locker room is not going to respect the interim coach because they say, fuck it, I'm here for three years. This guy's probably going to be gone by, I don't know, two more months. So when you have that, that's why you have the Nets giving Jock Vaughn an extension. That's kind of giving him, you know, that push of reassurance and saying to the locker room, this guy is going to be here. From your opinion, that's what you might be seeing. Especially when you have a team that's not winning and you have guys that are competitive. You have uh, Dennis Smith Jr. is somebody who hustles. And then when he sees other guys not hustling, it's like, fuck, it's probably pissing him off. Yeah. I mean, listen, I I didn't play at a professional level, but as a person who played basketball growing up, I mean, just if if you respect your coach, your coach is going to respect you. He's going to give you the opportunities that you deserve and you guys are going to work well together As, as grown men getting paid millions of dollars to play a child's game. The least you can do is respect the coach and try and build chemistry. That's all. I I just think that these guys are so out of it from losing that they have no care in the world anymore. I mean, like these guys are acting like they like like an attitude error where they can talk their shit and and do all these things, but you're not winning games. So it starts with trusting your coach, respecting each other and working together. And it just it does not look like they've done that once this year. Yeah, We could also hold hands and there's going to be rainbows around this, Dylan. Hey, that's what Nets Twitter wants. It's like it sounds nice, but that's not <laughs> that's, real. That's what Nets Twitter wants. That's what I argue every day with. This season has completely no. broken the, at least the Nets Twitter fan there, base. There was a re- yeah, there there was a reason why I waited until 2021 to download Twitter. And there is a strong reason why I try to stay off of it as much as possible. The the fan base is just it's so it's so 50-50 and it's just so like it's it's very far this way or very far that way. There's but it was better in New Jersey, right? I believe I believe the fan base was better. In you're crazy. You're yeah. fucking crazy. Hell yeah. You're I do. fucking crazy. Hell yeah, I do. I'm a new, I'm a, you're, I'm a you're, Jersey you're kid. I mean, listen, I went to the Dylan, you're fucking insane. I went to Eyes I went to Prudential. The, they had to sell jerseys that would go inside out of other players from other teams. Dude, the Yankees were selling Shohei jerseys. Who cares? The Yankees are the most prestigious organization in baseball. 
What's the difference? Yeah, but make the Yankees money. don't have other teams' players taking make over the money. arena. You had you listen. You were you were new to Jersey. It wasn't that large of a market. They were making money. Who cares? Shohei gets his jersey sold everywhere. It's money. That's how you make your money, right? So who cares? What point are you trying? What that makes no sense. You're trying to defend the New Jersey crowd by saying Shohei Otani sells his jersey everywhere. Well, the New Jersey crowd wasn't the ones, you know, asking for these jerseys. That was the that was the the owner in the in, in the arena trying to make money. They needed to make money at the time. Absolutely. It was it was Absolutely. it was a poverty. But how come New Jersey didn't like fill up the arena more? Because it was still a, considered a poverty franchise. I mean, we witnessed a twelve and seventy season. Nobody wants to go to that. Realistically, though, I mean, if you're if you're thinking so, so about the Sixers, from, should have the same issue. The Sixers did have that issue for a while, but the Sixers are also a team that's been in the league for what forty plus years, fifty plus years. They have a fan base. Philadelphia is one of the best cities when it comes to sports, even though their fans suck. Their fans are loyal, but they suck. They they at least pack an arena though. They have loyalty. That's fair. There's there there's no loyalty for the Nets because they've bounced around for so long. We've went from Long Island to Isa to Prudential to to Brooklyn. There's there's no continuity. There, there, there's no there's no continued uh, continuity within what we've done as a franchise. Every 15 years, but you don't think that's now. just the Knicks thing that the Knicks have been here longer. Like you have the Yankees and Mets, right? Mm-hmm. Like you have the Yankees are far obviously a far dominant like fan base when it comes. Yeah, but the Mets to, still have a fan base, New York, right? You would the say Met, that. The Mets, I I mean, I would say Yankees fans are a lot more vocal and a lot more, you know, populated at the moment. But I mean, dude, Mets fans are are everywhere. I see a Mets fan every day. Like, it's not like they're nowhere. But do I see a Nets fan every day? Hell no. Because you can't you can't stay loyal to a team that can't even stay loyal to its own city. We've been bounced around forever. So, I mean, there's really listen, I'm not worried about it because I know that I have stuck with this team everywhere it goes. But from a personal standpoint. And I mean, this is just me from a personal standpoint because of me going to games. I would much rather drive 30 to 40 minutes to Newark than drive what should be a 20 minute drive to Barclays that takes an hour and 20 minutes, then pay $40 in tolls and $40 in parking and 100 for tickets for a piss poor team. I, you know, it, it's just, it's not my thing. And I also hate the city. So it's always a personal preference. But I was going to say, uh, that's not very personal. I don't know if a yeah, lot of no. fans have that same issue. I live 15 no, it minutes is away from the Barclays Center. So yeah. I don't, I, you know, I don't have that I, issue. I, I do think I do think if they want yeah, no, if they wanted a real fan base, New Jersey was the place because you could build off of that. Though it was Yeah, but the players are not low. gonna come to New Jersey. It's been said Ky- it's been Kyrie would have won. Ky- Kyrie was going to the Nets, whether he was in New Jersey, whether he was in Brooklyn, or whether he was in Timbuktu. Okay, so and name another star that up. came to that came to New Jersey that came to the New Jersey Nets. Traded that was not Vince, a trade. Traded for- I'm waiting. But but that's but that's the thing. The no, Nets as a franchise have an always been trade. An the Nets have always been a trade destination. The tr- the Nets have always been a trade destination. We have never had cap space it's like that. There's no such reasons. thing as a trade destination. You make a trade to give up a player and picks that they, they go to the other team. It's not a destination. Harden had this as a destination, right? Well, Whether it's Brooklyn or New Jersey, it doesn't matter. KD wanted him. KD had the relation with him, and KD got him. Whether that was in New Jersey or Brooklyn, it would have happened. That's a fact. You know, we bro, we don't know that. We, we definitely don't know that. But you don't know definitely that don't stars know. wouldn't start coming here once we get better in Jersey. Then how come when New Jersey was good, how come they didn't get all the stars then? I mean, think about it, dude. We traded all of our picks. We had no me not salary. Think about it. Think about it. If we stayed the course, no, no, Jersey, to answer my question, we would have had. How come they we were not? They were good in New Jersey. And Jason Tatum what happened with Brooke Lopez? But but you're not listening to me. Think about it. The year that we traded those picks for the first year in Brooklyn, right? We literally could have had, we could have had Damian Lillard and Brooke Lopez. We could have had Milwaukee with, with what's going on over there, but earlier and in their primes. So it's not like you can't land. The Nets as a whole have always been a destination that either drafts or trades. There's very, very limited free agents that we've ever signed. The only two that we really have is KD and Kyrie. Over the last twenty oh, years, yeah. correct? Now, yeah, now I got to interrupt you because you just said you, I love what you just said. What did you say? Their destination that trades and drafts. That sounds like a team or a franchise that can't land a free agent. No, it just sounds like a team that doesn't financially make that themselves can't land available. A free agent. To... Exactly, they have to trade. Go ahead. We I got we got to stop interrupting because... each other. Go ahead. <laughs> no, because I mean, in all honesty, you, there's there's very few teams that can land a free agent. Boston doesn't land free agents; they trade. 
Because why? They don't have the cap salary to land free agents. Most teams that are contending don't have the assets or the, or the financial flexibility to land a player in free agency. Do you know how rare it is for a player to land in free agency? There's what? Maybe one star every year that goes somewhere else because they have the cap salary? It's not like free agency is this big, oh my God, everybody's going here, here, and there. Like it takes... It takes a yeah, team like blowing a fly, it up. It takes a team. Moving teams. You know, that doesn't yeah, happen, but right? No, it doesn't happen very often. The Lakers, they were they were a poverty franchise for two, three years after after the or towards the end of the Kobe era and into the, the beginning stages of once he retired. Right? The Clippers, they had just blown up the, the, the Lob City team officially, and they were looking for, for two stars. They they made that cap salary. Teams can't make cap salary very often. It takes two, three years to do so. So it's like, realistically, what are we expecting in free agency when we're paying Ben Simmons 40 million, Cam Johnson 20 million, and we're trying to pay Nick Claxton 20 to 25 million? Like, you can't sign free agents like that. So free agency is is, is a myth. It's very rare for teams to really go out there and be able to sign a superstar in free agency because cap flexibility is very rare in the league. Trades is the way to do it. And we've done that pretty well, whether it was in Jersey or it was in, in Brooklyn so far. What do you think about Cla- – I'm happy you brought up Claxton. What do you think about Claxton? Trade deadline. I really thought he was going to get traded for the mm-hmm. reason – Yeah, we talked about you that. just said, we have Ben Simmons' $40 million cap hit right there, mm-hmm. CJ's contract, Bridges' contract, and so mm-hmm. on and so forth, right? I'm not sure what they're trying to do if they're really trying to get a star because they really cannot fit in another $20 million salary. And now it's gotten to the point when they probably should have traded him, maybe get a couple picks back or whatever, you know, whatever you were going to get. But now uh, you have a team like Memphis who maybe Mm -hmm. could go under the cap and just sign him outright. You have a team like OKC that could do a little magic and find a way to sign him. And now Mm -hmm. we kind of have to expect a lot of people are saying, oh, Pete, let's do a sign and trade with him. He has to play ball. He has to be like, yeah, I'm down with that. Because if he could just go to Memphis for, you know, for quote unquote, for free without having to be part of a trade, he doesn't have to help the Nets. What do you think about all that? It, it, it's, it's a difficult situation because you don't ever want to lose a player who has a pretty decent value for nothing. I personally think what the Nets need to do is, is sign him. And the issue with signing him, though, is like we've said, you can't have four guys making 20 plus million dollars who are three through five options. It's just, it's not a recipe for success. What I do think is, is Claxton does have respect for the organization. I mean, he's dealt with trade rumors forever and he has continued to play. He's continued to play hard. I do think though, that he does desire playing for a contender. I do think that he has a great relationship with John Morant. And I do think Memphis is a destination that he will likely want to go to, but I do also see him having respect for us. I could see him re-signing with us, you know, whether it's for a little bit lower so he can get traded to Memphis or, you know, if it's for the, if Memphis says they would take him in on that 20 to $25 million deal, I do see that as a possibility for a sign and trade though. I don't think that he would openly walk and say, fuck you to the Nets. I do think there is a way though, that if he says, listen, I want to give you guys the benefit of the doubt, but I don't want to be here anymore. I see, I can see them working on a sign and trade as well. Ultimately, if I'm Brooklyn, I'm starting to work on that now. I, I would say, listen, Memphis, if you want him, we'll sign him, but you got to draft the player that we want with your pick. And I, we want him once we make this sign and trade. That that was one of the ideas that I put out uh, probably about last week. Um, you know, And there's Nets fans that overvalue Claxton a lot. I've been a huge Nick Claxton fan since he's been here. I do think that he is a great player, but I just don't think that he has what it takes to be a 20 to $25 million player on a – mediocre team if he's on a contender and can you know show his defensive value by all means that's great jaron jackson can shoot so that helps claxton a lot within the paint um he can rebound when you know when he wants but ultimately i do think moving on from him via sign and trade is is the best option i saw Matt fan saying if we're not getting uh their pick this year and a pick next year i don't want it we have to stop overvaluing him we're acting like getting a top seven pick is not valuable. Um, And that's likely what Memphis is going to get this year. Straight up, I would take their pick this year and and Luke Kennard. It's an expiring contract. Begin the rebuild. 
it's it's that simple. I mean, that's a free what Luke Kennard's making about fourteen million, I think, this year. Something like that. But you, there's some by, by floor, uh, you got some flawed logic with your with your thinking. I'm going to tell you why. Okay. Let's hear it. If I'm Nick Claxton, right, and I'm going to go to Memphis, going to Memphis in a sign and trade would mean they're giving up an asset. Mm-hmm. His new team would get weaker, right? So if I'm Nick Claxton and they could sign me outright, I'm not. I don't want to. St- I, no, I'm not going to help the Nets. We have a seventh overall pick. Maybe they could get uh, another player. Maybe they can get uh, a star or something with that. I don't know. I'm making that up. Maybe they can get an all-star to add to the roster for that seventh overall pick. Why am I going to give it to the Nets? I like the Nets and all, but goddamn, they try to trade me. I almost got traded to Toronto two years ago for a first-round pick. They don't want to pay well, me. Going to, this is a younger all-star team. Why am I going to mm-hmm. weaken my team? My new team, I mean, why? Re- realistically... It makes a ton of sense. Houston's in the same position where they have young players. They are, you know, that true star away from making some some noise. But Memphis has the contender. They don't need the pick. They don't need Luke Kennard. Luke Kennard's not a true well, asset. Why that's weaken the team, though, Dylan? Well, why, why would that, I weaken my new how, team? How is that weakening the team, though? Because realistically, that's that, that's a, that top seven overall pick probably won't play. You have young guys like Vince Williams and Gigi Jackson Forget who solidify themselves as role players. I want to all star for Trading that seventh him. overall pick. By all means, they can try, but I don't see why they would do that when they have John ja Morant, Desmond Bain, and, and, and Jaron Jackson. Desmond Bain want to get better. Why? Why not yeah. add an all star? But Bain's roster. extension kicks in this year, so it's not like they're going to have the cap flexibility to bring in a superstar or a star. Now would be the they time can't... to do it. Then it would seem before his if extension. They, if if, if they were willing to trade Bain Kennard in that pick, then maybe. But I don't see them wanting to trade Bain. Bain's a great fit around Ja and Jaron Jackson so far. No, He's no, a good I'm shooter. saying, forget, okay, forget about all that. My point is, why would you give up an asset to weaken your team, your new team? But we've already, but that's what I'm getting to is, is, is how is that weakening their team? They already have the role players. They have because Santi Aldama. They have Gigi Jackson. You don't use the pick on a player. You use it to get an all star. So you wouldn't want to add an all star to your team. But that's what I just said. How are they going to add an all star when they already have th- three guys making border of over 25 million? It's just, what are they going to do? They're going to go over the luxury tax even more and, and ruin whatever chances they have of retaining guys like Gigi Jackson, Vince Williams in the in the near future. I doubt that. Maybe. Well, maybe maybe you get maybe you get something else. Maybe you get a cheaper, I don't know, two or three guys or something. I point is that that is an asset. Like if you were the Nets, you overall pick. If you were if let's take let's switch the rosters up. Pretend the Nets mm-hmm. have the have, have the Grizzlies roster. There, I got to say it right. At the Grizzlies <laughs> roster, right? We have the seventh yeah. overall pick. Nick Claxton says he wants to come to our team. Mm-hmm. You would say, oh, we don't want that seventh overall pick to add to our roster with John Morant, Bain, and everybody you just said? You would want to just give it's, it up? It's, it's appealing, but it's appealing, but financially it's something that could hurt you in the long term. So that's why I, I'm saying if Memphis really wants him, they can trade for him. Because I've already heard people – in Memphis saying they don't know if he's worth 20 to 25 million. So they may not want to go out there and give him that. Now, if he takes a hometown discount to go play with Ja, maybe they can get him, but I don't see them offering North of 20 million. And I don't see any other team offering him North of 20 million, especially with the way that he's played this year. But really the only team that's going to be willing to give him that. And I do think that if we are willing to give him that, there's a reason for it. I don't see him as a big man who's worth 20 plus million for four years. I do see him being worth that maybe as a fourth option on a contender. But again, we're not going to be a contender anytime soon. So there's really no need for it. And like I said, Memphis is in the same position as Houston, if not better, which they are better. Uh, They will be fully healthy next year with a contender in the West. Adding a solidified defensive player of the year candidate in Claxton is next next to a defensive player of the year winner. And all-star and and a great third option scorer in, in Desmond Bain. I don't see why they wouldn't want to do that and give up that pick. I don't think that pick hurts them. Just like how, just like the reason why Houston was willing to give us some of our picks back, because it's not going to hurt them. They already have their young players. They don't need younger players. They need to go after guys who are going to help them compete. And that's really where those two franchises are, which is why I've been highlighting them as two guys that could be, you know, potential trade options to getting future picks and, and, and picks this year, next year, that could really help us rebuild a lot sooner rather than, you know, when our picks kick in in 2027. Yeah, I, I think you're you're undervalu- undervaluing the seventh overall pick, 
even in a shitty draft like this year, but we could always, you know, agree to disagree on whatever with, with that. Uh, looking I, at I the roster, go ahead. I was going to say, j- just to get out of the way real quick, I don't see how people are saying that this draft class isn't that good. It's young. And you know, I don't know, bro. Potential. I have a, okay, I got a bone to pick, not with you, but with people, because mm-hmm. like, I, I don't, I'm not very good with, with the draft. I study mm-hmm. the draft after the next season is over, right? Because these stocks of these players, they go up and down. What do you think about the draft this year? Is it as shitty as people say? Because I have people I swearing up and down. It's good. Yeah. But I don't know. I, I, Everyone's so many I different. Don't, I don't think this draft class is shit whatsoever. I think the people are saying that it's shit because there's not a Wembenyama. There's not a Zion Williamson. There's not there's, there's no like true hyped up number one overall pick. And I think that's the reason people are saying it's shit. But I mean, if you look at the top 10, you got Alexander Saar, Matt Bazelis, who's an 18-year-old power forward. He's 6'10", great player. He has tons of potential. Rob Dillingham, Stefan Castle, Isaiah Collier. Um, there, there is a ton of people. I mean, even later in the first run, you have this guy that I was looking at, Kowell Ware uh, from Indiana. He's a seven-foot big, shooting uh, 57% from the field, 44% from three, averaging 15 a game, nine points, and almost two blocks per game. Like, th- these are players that could solidify themselves as starters, great role players, maybe even third options if they really improve. So I don't see how it's considered a shit class. But I can definitely see why people are saying it because there's not the true hyped up, you know, generational number one pick. But that's the only thing that I don't see in this draft class. Would you be opposed to the Nets maybe buying a second rounder? Is it worth it to buy a second rounder in a draft like this? I don't think so. I, I think second round picks are, are truly one in a thousand where you'll actually land a guy who's on your team for more than two years. I, I don't I don't value second round picks like that. Um, so I personally wouldn't. If I'm doing anything, I, I also put this out in my little, you know, way too early uh, off-season idea. Trading DFS to New Orleans for uh, uh, their, their pick swap with Milwaukee. It's going to be a, probably a pick 19 through 24. Uh, and that's where I wanted to get Khalil Ware, especially if we're going to move on from Nick Claxton and try and move up to that top seven pick. It's a curveball at you. All right? Listen to All this. Right. You're Sean Marks now. You have to go star hunting. What's the first thing you do in the off-season? Do you trade a Cam Thomas? To get a Donovan Mitchell? First thing you do is you see which one between Trey Young and, and, and Donovan Mitchell. You grab one of them first. That, that's that's the, the centerpiece of this offseason. Uh, I know San Antonio has huge links right now to, to Trey Young, whether it's Trey Young's camp wanting him there or Trey Young wanting to play with uh, Weminyama or the Spurs passing up on DeJounte Murray knowing that they can get Trey Young this offseason. Um, that's a perfect perfect fit for him. But if there's a way that we can land him, I would love to. I think he is uh, one of the best point guards in the league as of right now. I mean, he's averaging, what, 26 and 10. Um, you know, he started off the year a little rough, but he has been great ever since. He's a multi-time all-star, still only 25 years old. I think he's a perfect fit for this team. Donovan Mitchell's another player. I mean, this guy's having an MVP caliber season. Uh, he's never missed the playoffs. He's a winner. He wants to play in New York. I don't think the Knicks are going to take the chance on him seeing what they they did to Cleveland last year with two six one guards. I don't see the Knicks wanting to pair two six one guards together who can't really defend well. So the Knicks are doing everything right in that sense on passing on him this year, uh, last year, and you know potentially moving forward. But I would pick between one of those two. If you land one of those two, pivot towards a player like Laurie Markkinen. It's going to be a little bit pricey, but... No doubt in my mind, if, if you can get Trey Young or Donovan Mitchell, you can trade Cam Thomas. I'd pack his bags for him. Ah, that's hilarious. The Cam Thomas stands are going to be up your ass for that, by the way. Listen, this is a guy who's averaging 20 points right now. He's been hurt twice this year. His consistency has been garbage. I like Cam Thomas, right? I, I was originally on the whole, this guy's going to be nothing. I was proven wrong. He's solid, but he's not a guy who who's going to win games. He's not. He doesn't have the defensive capability to do so. His playmaking is improving slightly, but nothing to a point where, you know, you can really consider it a second dimension to his game. Like I've said forever, I base things off of dimensions. There's there's reasons why superstars are superstars. They have three plus dimensions to their game, whether it's, you know, scoring, playmaking, defending, scoring, playmaking, rebounding, like Luka. Um, there's there's reasons for that. Two dimension players are the stars. That's like the, you know, the, the DeMar DeRozans of the league, the Paul, like, like these are, you have to have at least two dimensions. Cam Thomas has one and it's scoring and it's still not a dimension to his game because it's inconsistent. So I truly believe he's expandable, especially if it's a guy like Donovan Mitchell or Trey Young. The whole idea of wanting to win now and be a contender is you need guys who you can trust. And I don't think Cam Thomas is somebody who you can trust right now. 
the Nets make the playoffs if if Jesus Christ is reincarnated. I mean, <laughs> yeah. this, this team this team is garbage. It's garbage. I like I said earlier before we even started recording. I have never wanted a season to end mm-hmm. quicker in my life. I have not enjoyed watching this team whatsoever. It's probably the worst offense I've seen in over eight years. It is. It's pathetic. It's it's pathetic. I was gonna say. Uh, I'm not sure if I asked you this last time, so I'm gonna ask you it again. Mm-hmm. You know, we're still obviously we're still in a wrap up. We have a Nets jersey next year. That's a throwback. Which one is it? What's your favorite throwback? Give give me the give me the white and navy New Jersey colors. It's long overdue. Like the home. Yep, it's long overdue. That's a beautiful jersey. I can't wait for that to come back. I hope that's, they do that's, next that's year. another. Yeah, that's another reason why I have resentment towards Brooklyn is they have completely tried to diminish the fact that there is a New Jersey culture that was there, uh, and a fan base that was there. They've tried to push it away and, and put it under the rug for so long. That that's half of your fan base still. All right, Dylan. Been a great episode. I'm sure there's gonna be lots of clips made of me yelling with my hoarse voice. <laughs> uh let's get some plugs in there for you. How could how could the people follow the villain of Nets Twitter? Screw Twitter. I actually hate it. I don't I don't use it very often. Uh go follow me just over on Instagram. We have <laughs> exactly <laughs> just just to talk shit. And that's the fun part too, is people think it's so serious. I I I don't even have notifications on on my phone for for Twitter. I go on Twitter, I go and check something, and I mess around with people. So, yeah, definitely go follow me on Instagram. We're on the road to 20K. I think we're at 19.7 currently. Uh, We have updated graphics and stuff, too. So uh, a much more professional look moving forward. uh, And I'm looking forward to this off-season's content. At NetFans, you know, on YouTube, on Twitter, one to two episodes every week. Nets content coming at you uh, pretty much as fast as I can get these things out. If you guys are at lunch right now, enjoy your lunch. If it's the weekend, enjoy your weekend. Whatever you guys are doing, be safe. And uh, let's go Nets. We're out. Let's go Nets.